A very good evening to you, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the fifth edition of Transform Kenya that is coming to you live from Daystar University here at the Valley Road campus. Now, Transform Kenya is a platform, a forum that was initiated by the Standard Group. What it does is that it creates a forum where various stakeholders and people in the country can come together and converse about issues that affect everyday people in the country. In the past, we have discussed issues to do with environmental sustainability. We've talked about health in the country. We've talked about basic education, food security. And this evening, we shall be focusing on higher education in Kenya. What are the issues affecting the delivery of higher education in the country? Are there successes that we need to take note of? So we shall be talking about all these issues. And I'm not driving this conversation alone. I'm here this evening to have this conversation with you, just right here with our audience here in Daystar Valley Road campus, as well as if you join us uh, from home uh, on our various social media platforms. And I'm here with my colleagues, Akisa Wande, and Frank Otieno. Akisa. Thank you, Sharon. A very, very jam-packed evening ahead of us in terms of knowledge and information. In the recent past, we have seen the higher education sector being dogged by lecturers' strike. We have seen student undress across the various universities in the country. Most recently, we are in talks about some courses being deregistered, and this is just some of the myriad of challenges that are currently dogging the higher education sector in the country. But tonight, this particular forum is for having candid conversations on what really are the underlying issues and what are some of the possible solutions that will help us transform the higher education sector. We have the decision makers here. We have various stakeholders. We have those that this affects directly. Our audiences will be given a chance to participate actively in this conversation. And of course, as you say, we also have Frank Otieno, who's not just a journalist, but a teacher by profession, Frank. Asante sana. Huyo ni Akisa Wandera ki poromosha kingenge kwele kwele lakini mi ntazimu kwa kiswaili. Kazamaji, tunakushukuru sana kwa mba umechukua furusa hii adimu na adimu kujumuika nasi katika kipide hiki cha leo ambapo hii leo basi. Tunazungumiza kuhusiana na swala zito sana la elimu ya juu. Manake, kipide kilichopita tulikuwa na swala mada ya elimu ya msingi. Kumbuka kwa mba Basic Education Act inasema kwa mba elimu ya msingi naanzia chekechea hadik datu cha nne. Kwa hivyo ndiposa hii leo basi tunasonga mbele ili tuzungumuzia maswala haya. Tujue kwa mba jie kuna changa moto zipi katika swala zima la elimu ya juu. Ndiposa basi jopo hili tunao hapa watu wengi kocho kocho. Mejumuika nasi katika jopo hili. Bile vile katika hadhira upande huu tunao kwa mfano Profesor Jalangu Akilo pale. Tunae ndugu Muga Kulale pale. Oyuko Daktari Charles Muhuaya. Kwa hivyo watu wako wengi tu hapa kwa hivyo wakilishi mzima kabisa katika sekta nzima ya ilimu. Karibu ni sana. Naam, asante sana Franco Tena amesema kuna kocho <laughs> ya watu. We have various representation in the education uh, sector in the country participating in this conversation tonight. And we don't want to limit it uh, to the space here where we're having this conversation. Participate in this conversation. You can ask any question, any questions to us. I will be introducing our panelists this evening just now. But if you have any question, any comment, and want to throw it to our panelists or indeed to the audience here, you can ha do that. That, uh, on our various platforms, on our various social media platforms using the hashtag TransformKenyaSG. And we shall be engaging with you even as we continue with this conversation this evening. Now, let me introduce our panelists this evening. And to my immediate left uh, is Akelo Mizori, who is the Secretary General of CUPET. Uh, that is the Kenya Union of Post-Primary Education Teachers. Many thanks for joining us for this conversation, sir. Hello, viewers. And uh, right next to him, uh, who is also our host tonight, we have Professor Laban Airo, who is the Vice Chancellor here at Daystar University. Thank you very much, sir. Welcome to Daystar. Karibuni sana. Asante sana. And next to Prof, we have another Prof, Professor Mwendan Tarangui, who is the uh, CEO of Commission of University Education. Many thanks for joining us this evening, Prof. Good evening and thank you. 
Asante sana. And uh, Dr. Lucy Wakiaga also just ensuring that we have gender representation on the panel. Many thanks for joining us. Dr. Lucy Wakiaga is a senior lecturer, School of Education at the Tangaza University College. Asante sana for joining us this evening. Thank you and good evening. And right next to Dr. Lucy, we have Charles Ringera, who is the CEO of HELP. I'm sure many students, whatever they are watching, you have questions. And this is the man right in front of you. Should any questions you have, thank you, sir, for joining us this evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Right. And uh, at the far left, Dr. Constantine Wasonga, who is the Secretary General of UASU, University Academic Staff Union. Many thanks for joining us, uh, Dr. Tari. Good evening, viewers. Right, and we're just going to straight away kick the ball rolling. And before I do that, let me just appreciate our partners who made this possible, Daysta University, where we are hosted at tonight for being our partners in making this possible, Asante Nisana, uh, University of Academic Staff Union, Asante Pia for being our partners, and Kupex, and everyone for making your time to be part of this conversation. We want to say thank you for that. So uh, in our conversation tonight, we shall be traversing across various subjects touching on higher education in the country. And we want to make this conversation as engaging as possible. So even as we do that, if you have any question for any of the panelists or a comment, feel free to shoot up your hand and we can engage that even as we proceed with the conversation tonight. And I want us to just kick the ball rolling by talking about a big question. When we were preparing for this show and asking what are some of the big issues, uh, asking students, asking the stakeholders that they feel affect higher education in Kenya. And one thing really stood out is the issue to do with quality of education. And we must start by defining how do we measure that? Uh, what defines what is quality higher education to be specific. And I want to start with you, uh, Professor Laban Ayiro, just to talk about that. When we are dispensing education to, higher education, uh, to our students on the higher education platforms, what are the considerations in terms of ensuring quality and that the students that we eventually then release to the labor market have got the best from this institution? Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think quality is um, an elusive variable to chase around. But there are some tangibles that surround quality. One of them is, of course, the caliber of intake. Uh, the kind of students that we are taking into our universities and other tertiary institutions. And I think for us in Kenya, we can vouch for quality of the kind of students that get into our universities. Then there is the aspect of the human resource. The capacity of the faculty will determine the quality. The facilities, the infrastructure uh, determines quality. And uh, the elephant in the room is the financing of higher education. Uh, affects quality. Apart from remuneration of uh, the faculty, there is, uh, of course, the general running of the university. So quality uh, on the onset in Kenya in higher education is in abeyance. Uh, just scan your eyes through the universities in Kenya. And some of our universities, if you just take the aspect of infrastructure, some of our universities have... Uh, are so lacking in infrastructure that some of the high schools seem to be better positioned in terms of infrastructure. Yes. So the kind of education that institution would give is obviously going to be of poor quality. I mean, how many universities in this country have amphitheaters like this? Uh, go to that other university. What are the chances that they will get the exposure that we are getting tonight at Desta? So quality is something this country must have a Marshall Plan to address. Right. Yeah. Right. And some of the other big questions touching to quality being delivered 
is, as a come, that has come up as an issue is the number of institutions that we see mushrooming in the country. We have so many universities. In fact, we have statistics for that. At the moment, we have a total number of 90,587 total institutions from uh, elementary all the way to tertiary and university institutions. Now, specifically, and this is according to the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics, we have 74 universities in the country at the moment. And this is coming from, I remember just a few decades, maybe two decades back, that you could count the number of universities, you know, just on one hand. And let's talk about that. What is driving this, uh, you know, mushrooming, this multiplication of uh, institutions? And is there quality control? And this is a question that I'd, I'd like to pose to you, Professor Mwenda. Uh, the process in actually chartering these institutions and the necessity of it. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, I would say that uh, we went through a phase in the last uh, five years where we had uh, a number of universities that uh, uh, came to being. Uh, we were grappling as a nation with the issue of access and how giving people an opportunity to go to universities in Kenya. Uh, before 2012, you know, we had very few uh, universities and it became clear that we needed more universities. But in that process, we accelerated the number of universities that was not matched by resources to enable them to grow at a pace where they could be supported well to offer the kind of uh, quality education that was needed. Do we have too many universities? I think that's a debatable question. Do we have universities that we can support e uh, clearly and better? Maybe that's a challenge because if we think of the percentage of students that uh, uh, are getting into our universities after finishing uh, Form 4, for instance. It's a very s small percentage. Uh, compared to other developed nations, of course, uh, our universities are few. Some, if you go to Indonesia, maybe one little state will have as many uh, universities will have. So we're talking about, do we have the capacity to support what we have? We could have two, but if you're not supporting them well, they're not offering the kinds of things that we want. So uh, I think that's the, the challenge for us. And as we look at this, we have to see this as an opportunity uh, to see higher education also as a process. It's not one event, one day we come and we get there. But we have to have calculated steps. And what we are doing at the commission is to carry out the kinds of standards and qualities to make sure that we walk through with the universities to see the kinds of things that Professor Ayura has talked about, facilities, right. teaching, resources, so that we can allow uh, our students to do that. But the biggest challenge is that we do not have the, those kinds of resources, so we are challenged uh, as, a, as, a, as a nation and as a subsector in terms of offering the top-notch quality that we want. But let me also say that these are not limited to Kenya. Higher education growth uh, through the massification that we've seen has been all over the world. Many, many students uh, getting access. It's no longer an elite uh, opportunity for people to go to school. Many other people from different backgrounds have a chance to go to university. So we have to grapple with those access and quality. We have to grapple with those matters. Right, and I just want to throw this question on uh, the quality and what this number of institutions uh, mean in terms of delivery. Can we support, as you say? And I know Amos Kaburu is somewhere uh, in this crowd just and had specific questions to do with that. Um, in terms of access, there is on one hand the issue of access, and on the other hand, uh, does it jeopardize on the quality uh, of education as being delivered? Well, of course, Sharon, it's a conversation that we've had several times with uh, Amos Kaburu, and um, you have had concerns. Just the other day, we had an interview with you, and you have had serious concerns about the quality of education in the country. Talk to us about them. Yes, my name is Amos Kaburu. I work for Tuaweza East Africa, which is a regional institution working in Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania, focusing on quality of our education. I strongly feel that our university education in this country does not have a quality philosophy. We don't have a, philo a philosophy basically for quality. And that is the reason why we battle with these tensions of 
uh, providing opportunities to everyone or to as many people as possible. Because I equally agree with Professor Mwenda that I do not think that we have too many universities. What we just need to have done is to ask ourselves, what should be the purpose of university education? And therefore support our institutions to deliver to this quality. The second most challenge that we face is over this, I mean, over decentralization of what quality would be. But this is not just a problem to this country. We agree that university sen senates should have played a bigger role. But I think that we have serious challenges of governors in our universities where the senates that we have are seriously uh, having challenges to an extent that whatever they would have put in place as quality measures are seriously lacking. Because you have problems of tribalism, you do not need to... I mean to ask a question on if you walk to any county in this country and there is a vice chancellor from that particular community. They will tell you that this is our university. And therefore, this tribalization or an extent to which we have ethnicized our universities to now look like village polytechnics, I think is very, very unfortunate. And this has seriously dealt on the challenge of quality. But lastly, I think that we need to define quality from the end user perspective. What is the functionality of our graduates. I think it's very, very important when we have that in mind so that we work with it to ensure that whatever product that we get, it's quite, uh, I mean, it can respond to the issues. It is not enough that our universities do not have a philosophy. They are not driven by anything. They are overusing resource from KCSE. And that's the reason why you wonder, right. do you need to admit students purely on the basis of the scores that they got in KCSE? Or will there be other better mechanisms of ensuring that we support our students, getting their anti behaviors and therefore constructing and designing experiences right. in a way that will support these children when they live there to have a better future, rather than where we've reached where it is. Ora elimu, si elimu bora. Thank you. Right. And, and I think uh, Prof Professor Ntarang will let you respond because he's talked about uh, the measures, quality ensuring measures, uh, whether they are not um, you know, functioning as would be optimum. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Amos. I think what you've uh, uh, mentioned here is how do we develop a culture of quality so that we, as a regulator, when we come to the university, we're just coming to check that things are going on, rather than uh, to look for the things that you're not doing right. And when you say we, we start uh, with the, the student as, uh, as the point of, of entry, I think that's, that's key because then it allows us to say what kind of graduate do we want to come out of this institution? And what are the programs and, 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 and ways of engaging with that student so that they become that which you want them to become at the end of it. But I think, uh, uh, as you know, uh, building a culture of quality takes time. Building a culture where we are looking at other abilities of students, as it's been now introduced in the new uh, curriculum, where we are saying we can do certain things differently, uh, I think is, is something that uh, we ought to um, uh, be also embracing, so that uh, we see students coming in as individuals with different abilities outside of just having a good grade in one exam. But the culture, what we have tried to do is to have quality assurance uh, officers in universities who will help us become the point of entry for us in the university to build that culture. But it also starts with the teachers in the classroom, the students themselves asking for the, 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 the kinds of uh, teaching that they want to have so that they also raise the bar. As the teacher raises the bar, the students raise the bar, the administration raises the bar. So our work as a regulator will become to see, yes, you've done what you've said uh, you're doing, and we build that culture over and over. But I also want to say that it's not just at the university. The culture has to be built from the day one when we go into school. So that when we come in, we're already used to that. It is not something that we just come at the university level. The university, we've already been shaped. By the time they are 18, our, our ideas and ways of doing things have been shaped. So it's a, it's a, a whole system of, of, of nurturing that kind of culture. So that we can move as a nation in ways that uh, are where we want to be. Right. But also let me say that even as we talk about this, we have a very good uh, education system. We just want to make it better. If you traveled around, uh, even in the region, you'll know 
that we have uh, something that others uh, also would like to have. But we don't stop there. We know our bar is high and we have to keep at it. But we build that right. culture from day one all the way to postgraduate. Yeah. Right. And Dr. Lucy, the other side of this conversation to do with quality is a kind of quality of lectures that students are getting. Do you feel as lecturers that even from where you sit, you are bettering yourselves? There's publishing, are lecturers publishing, are lecturers doing all those yards that, you know, as an academic, you, you know, usually take? Uh, thank you so much, Sharon. Um, first of all, I think Professor mentioned about an elephant in the room, and I think there are several elephants in the room today. So um, coming back into the whole issue of uh, quality, I would like to just piggyback a bit on what Professor Mwenda has said mm -hmm. in terms of when exactly does quality actually begin. And uh, as he has mentioned, it starts from the day that little boy or that little girl enters uh, early learning, uh, the early learning classroom. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, even if we require the, um, the students, maybe at the university level, to kind of advocate for the education that they want, mm -hmm. this has to be something that starts from that very beginning. How do we even empower the parents to be able to be vested in education? We find that that is a problem. And all through, uh, from primary school to high school, mm -hmm. you find parents, uh, and I hear this a lot, I mean, uh, the school of education and we prepare educational leaders, we prepare principals. And principals tell, the, my students who are principals tell us when parents come, they wait for the school, uh, the school to open so that they can say, tumewaletea watoto wenyu, mm -hmm. you know. So where is that sense of responsibility even for the parents to be engaged in the learning process? Mm -hmm. So it continues onwards and even when our young people join the university, then there's not that much push, mm -hmm. okay? But now turning on to ourselves and in terms, of, um, in terms of whether we feel we are adequately prepared or not, of course if there's something broken in one end of the system, definitely there's something going on in another end of the system. Mm -hmm. So even for ourselves, and it's, it goes way back even when I was in the university, uh, talking about uh, lecturers who come with yellow notes, uh, lecturers who come and they year in, year out, they are teaching the same thing. Uh, so that tends to be a challenge. So even for us, and I know this might sound like a cheesy comment, uh, but where is that selflessness mm -hmm. uh, where we look into ourselves and say, this young man or this young lady who is in my class is going to go out and is supposed to impact the world. Mm -hmm. So even for me, coming into that class every day, how do I then prepare myself so that I can give the quality education mm -hmm. that Professor is, uh, is talking about? Mm -hmm. But then it's, I can't really uh, put the blame on the lecturer per se, because there are so many other moving parts mm -hmm. to that situation whereby I'm quote unquote coming in with the yellow notes. Mm -hmm. We look at issues of pay, okay? Uh, how well are the lecturers being remunerated, okay? And at the end of the day, it is not that I'm going to be selfless. I'll want to be selfless. I'll want to give my best, but I'm also a human being. And right. the first thing I have to do is to meet my basic needs. Mm -hmm. I have my child there who wants to go to high school. I have to make sure that school fees is there. So what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. I'll be at Daystar, I'll be at Tangaza, I'll be at University of Nairobi. I'll be moonlighting mm -hmm. so that I can make that extra coin. Right. So then it's a push and pull for myself in terms of what is really important. And at the end of the day, if I cannot meet my basic needs, it will be very difficult for me to say, let me give selflessly to my students. Right. And because of those other variables that I'm talking about, you find that we are not able to meet what Q has put for us, that you have for you to advance and to be ranked, mm -hmm. you have to publish, you have to do community service, you have to do this and that, mm -hmm. because we are too, too busy trying to find income to support ourselves. Right. So there are so many moving parts
to that kind of uh, situation. Right, and you've touched largely uh, on matters to do with motivation of the teachers and the lecturers, which is what, where I want to bring in Dr. Wasonga, uh, you know, as a voice representing the academic staff. How important is it and to what extent does this, you know, the motivation of the lecturers and the teachers then affect the quality of education, higher education in Kenya? Thank you very much. I want to say that a demotivated lecturer cannot deliver quality education. Lecturers in public universities are demotivated because they are working under difficult conditions. One, the exponential growth that we have witnessed from the year 2003 to date is too much. In 2003, we had seven universities. And now we have 31 universities. This growth has not been matched with the facilities in our universities. This growth has not been matched with the number of lecturers in our universities. I want to give you an example. The last class I taught, I had 1,200 1, students. That was a common cause. Even if you teach like Jesus Christ, <laughs> you cannot deliver quality education. <laughs> because that is a market. When I was at the university, a lecturer was lecturing, then we had tutorial fellows to give tutorials. But nowadays, what is happening in our universities, tutorial fellows have been turned into lecturers. And those are, that is a training position. And this is why I follow the Commission for University Education. We have numbers, the number of lessons that is supposed to be taught by tutor fellows. The number of lectures that are supposed to be taught by assistant lecturers and graduate assistants. But universities are giving these people full load. In that situation, you cannot offer quality education. I want to say you can also not offer quality education because of mismanagement. Our senates are not independent because quality education is supposed to be monitored from the senate. But if senators are appointees of one individual, and now university managements do not want senators to be elected from faculties, so it means when they go to senate, they cannot even question bad policies, because they are appointees of one individual. When they go to Senate, it is yes. Whether it is wrong, the Vice Chancellor has said. And there is a reason why professors were supposed to sit in Senate. Because professors are at the same level with the Vice Chancellor. If you are doing something wrong, this is your peer, he will tell you this policy is wrong. But now, check all the university statutes. They don't want deans to be elected. They don't want uh, directors to be elected. They want to appoint their students. That is where the problem is. And with that system, you will not get quality education. Two, a lecturer that is underpaid will moonlight. Lecturers are moving from university to university. And this is the reason why you realize during graduation, campuses are full. Students are looking for marks. Marks are missing. I want to say that there is nothing like missing marks in our public universities. Lecturers are overworked. How can I mark 1,200 scripts and you expect me to concentrate and deliver quality education? Let us not joke. <laughs> All right, and I want to bring you in at that point. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be looking at a story uh, that shows the financing of uh, higher education and how health comes in in just a minute. But even as we are talking about the motivation and the place of you know, teachers and lecturers, I want to bring you in, sir, just to talk about that. Are we in a place where business is taking precedence over uh, you know, the quality of education with all these sprouting uh, institutions. And does it mean then that there's more workload for the teachers? Are you now doing quantity, doing a lecture here, a lecture there, lecture everywhere, as opposed to focusing on the delivery to students? Thank you so much, 
think uh, uh, so many things. Mm. Uh, motivation of the teacher, the student numbers versus the, na the workload, and uh, this one must affect the quality of learning. But more so when you have to have everybody to go to university, then you must have lecturers to teach them. Then the schools must also produce those numbers to go to the university. So that is where the issue is. But I want uh, uh, to deviate a bit by saying that what we see, what impacts again is quality of education in this country is that we are thinking about producing an economist who is becoming a teller in a bank. Why do you have to produce an economist who is becoming a tout? Uh, you know, uh, y y th that means that uh, people are going there just to get those degrees because even after getting them, they will definitely not have anything meaningful. So this is where the issue is. Right. It would be very, very important for us to also regulate uh, the number going to the university so that we devote a lot of time to key areas which require uh, uh, employability of those who go to uh, get a, a, a course, for example. Why must we have everybody going to the university when we don't even have plumbers, for example, to fix mm -hmm. what we have in the society? Uh, I think this is where we, we should devote our time to. Right. And I want to bring our Mr. Ringera into the conversation regarding financing of higher education for students, which is very important, and affordability versus, you know, uh, access in terms of uh, financial access for students. And a big question often has been regarding the fairness of distribution of these funds. Perhaps you can talk to us about the process involved and what ensures that the funds actually get, get to the students who most need it. Uh, thank you, Sharon. Um, the purpose of why Higher Education Notes Bond was created um, way back in 1995 through an act of parliament, CAP 213, was basically to make sure that uh, it, a revolving fund is created and that the students can be able to borrow um, affordable loans so that they can be able to pay back so that we can create a national revolving fund. And th that has been what we have been carrying through. Now, that aspect of borrowing is predicated on, the, on a need basis. So today we apply something called means testing instruments, which helps us in terms of identification of the means of the students. And it's an automated system. And we ask all manner of questions. I mean, for example, your guardian, your parent, uh, what is the economic household income, for example. That household income could be high, but then it is being utilized by a large pool of other siblings within the family. And also, what kind of cost structure do you have in terms of your funding for higher education? How much do you require to be able to be funded at higher education? Now, using that means test an instrument, then we are able to uh, decide how much uh, uh, you know, uh, a beneficiary of a loan should be able uh, to get against a portfolio of many others. So it runs around, uh, currently we have funding between uh, 42 and 60,000 with the most vulnerable uh, uh, applicant getting all the way up to 60,000. And even the orphans, you know, or the ones who are coming from complete abject poverty will then be able to get a, a, a bursary funded by government, which is not a loan that is not funded back on top of the 60,000 loan that they, uh, they, they get. And therefore, we have a pool today, like now you've seen 90,583 um, will be joining university. So. Out of the ones who will apply, not everybody of the 90,000 will apply because some of them the parents can be able to afford, but on, on, on that 90,000 we expect about 80,000 will be able to ap apply. Now, depending with the amount of funds we get from Exchequer and the ones that has removed from loan recoveries, we then put a pool and say, for the first time applications, they will require this amount of money. For example, in the year that we are 1819, um, um, we are using up to about 3.1 billion to be able to go to first time apl applicants. Now, that 3.1 billion will then be shared according to the number of applications, depending with their need levels. So we will spread it according to the way the machine will tell us what is the need level of a particular applicant. And that is the only way we have been able to uh, put equity and access uh, to uh, loan applications. 
equity in terms of using um, the means testing instruments, and also being able to spread the application process from wherever you are, even from your phone, from any of our Unduma centers, from the universities themselves, you can be able to apply. Again, that is increasing access of, of availability of the funds to higher education. Right. And at this point, uh, before we take the first break as we go on uh, the KT and Leo, our Swahili news, then I'm, I'm inviting questions and comments regarding quality of higher education as well as the access to the HELP funds. I'm sure we have students and lecturers as well. There was some passionate concerns from the lecturers and teachers. So we'll just take a few, then we'll take more when we come back from the break. Akisa. All right, over to the audience now. We'll definitely start by your name and introducing yourself before giving your comment. Yes, please. Thank you, moderator. Uh, my name is Dr. Harry Osore. Um, I started off my career in um, university. In the 80s, I was teaching in the university. And then I moved into global health. So I have some comments on the issue of quality. Uh, the whole issue of quality of higher education um, started off in the 80s. Uh, and I think the professors who are sitting in front here know the history. Um, way back around about 84, there was a debate in France on how to assure quality and avoid bureaucracy um, in the universities. Uh, that debate spread to the United Kingdom um, where um, the system of external examinations and all that was going on. And the government was trying to set up uh, some kind of policy, national policy on how to, to um, control the quality of, or assure the quality of uh, education in universities. Now, fast forward, that whole development, including the United S USA, where they left the whole system to the universities, um, has spread around the world, where uh, basically there are two systems. We have the internal quality assurance, uh, and you have the external quality assurance. And universities are required to have policies on how to control uh, or to ensure uh, quality of education internally. And in fact, um, if I can mention an example, um, Daystar is doing very well on that because I know that in your internal systems you have insisted that you have uh, what they call the tracer surveys following your graduates, your recent graduates into the uh, job market to see how they are doing. And as a result of that, you're able to, I think the first one you did was 2010 and the last one was 2015. As a result of that survey, you're able to see how your graduates compare with the other graduates from other universities. Um, and that feeds back to the universities, to, uh, to the university departments, um, to see how uh, lecturers can improve the way they perform um, their work. So. Um, I'll request if, that we just make it very precise. Yeah, I'm gonna, so maybe, I'm gonna be very short. Someone. Now, <laughs> what I'm saying is, we, we need, I know we have Commission for University Education, which really cannot police uh, the way universities deliver quality education. Um, they are ensuring that you know, universities have facilities, they have a library, and they have um, uh, you know, teaching staff and what have you. But we need to switch back and emphasize what the individual universities are doing. University of Nairobi has a directorate for quality assurance. Is it functional? Strathmore University was very responsive way back in 2003. They actually set up what something called QMS, Quality Management System. So the action seems to be more in the private universities than in the uh, uh, you know, public universities. The need for quality education is because now graduates cross borders and they get employment in other places. So we need to ensure that the quality that we are delivering is wholesome. Much to ensure that quality. Okay, we we of can only education. have one question yes. before we go on break. So, quick we question and answer. Less and than then, five yeah. minutes to go on a break. So, kindly be very, very. I'll be very brief. Thank you so much. My name is Moiga Rogara. I'm from Uasu. I'm a lecturer at J. Kuat. I want to go to Kue immediately. I can confidently say that since Kue was incepted, 
there has been gloping in dark concerning quality of education. One of the things they did, they allowed commercialization of education. They started asking for money to approve courses in the university. And as long as the university can afford to pay the 300,000 or 500,000, they approve a course. The universities that did not afford or did not, did not contact them, they have now declared all those courses useless. Now they are laughing all the way to the bank as the, as, as the universities are looking for them to pay for those courses so that they can declare them now good. That was in the papers. Now I want to ask, they have, dec they have, they have now said that they only want PhD only lecturers. The people with the PhD in Kenya are less than 4,000. Nairobi University requires 2,500 lecturers. Kenyatta University requires 1,500 lecturers. So all the 4,000 lecturers can only fit in, in two universities in Kenya. Are you going to close all the other universities? Number three, can you tell us what you have done to enhance infrastructure in public universities so that you can have 100 transition in in, uh, of students into public university. Now, when they allowed commercialization of education into public universities, the, 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 the first chancellor started declaring less students for government sponsored students and, and now leaving the rest of space for self sponsored students. Now, they have reversed the, after the Matiangi reduced the, the, the Cyprus from Cyprus and above, they have reversed the process. They are now killing the public universities by taking all the Cyprus, or uh, most of the Cyprus, to private universities. They have just reversed the, 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 the process. Now we have CG private, public, response, and the student. Before we had the private, public, private sales funds are the students. So I think there is a lot of confusion in Kue, and as people in charge of quality, they need to come up and declare their interest. OK. Uh, we'll come. <laughs> <laughs> of course, these are things that uh, will be addressed when you get back from the break. Uh, he has raised a number of points. We will get the panelists to respond to some of these questions that have been raised by um, the two that have... I know there are a lot of other questions, but let's take a quick break. We'll be back. This is Transform Kenya coming to you live from Daystein Valley Road. Do not go too far. <laughs> 